Would you welcome, please, Mr. Charlton Heston. I thought you'd just come down from the mountain with the tablets. <laughs> well, I... Good to see you again. Nice to see you, John. I missed you up in, uh, in Las Vegas yes, last weekend. Was, uh... That's one of the few that uh, you missed, because I know you're a real tennis player. That was quite and... a tournament. Yeah, too. Alan King really puts on a show up there, a first-class show at Caesars Rodney Palace. Rodney George and... played a pretty good match, didn't he? Man? Yeah, I suppose people who aren't tennis buffs might, might get bored with people talking about tennis, but I think it's becoming a more popular sport, and lots of people are playing it. And to watch Rod Laver up there the other day, Oh, play all of those uh, fellows. Uh, well, as you said, absolutely Sir remarkable. Alan King. And that's uh, just another sport than what we're hacking around. I said it's a game with which I'm not familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I ran so. into a, a young Tom Gorman who was about 28 years old and uh, a very nice young man. And he was leaving uh, the airport that day, and we were standing in the lobby. And he says, "You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit depressing." And I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "Well, when I was in school and I was thinking about becoming a professional," he said. I figured, you know, Rod Laver would probably be retired by the time I turned professional. Because he said many tennis players by 30 right. uh, kind of hang up the game or a little slower. And he says it's very defeating because here's Laver, I think, is going to be 36 next year and is still playing and so remarkable. He said it's awfully defeating to go out. He says because you can't psych yourself up that you're better than he is. Yeah, he said the only way you can beat him is he says if you play great. superbly and great and, the other, and he's off his game. Yeah. So he says, I thought he'd be retired, and he's still playing. <laughs> yeah. He says, you, had, you, uh, well, you were up there for the uh, trip, but I didn't see you playing up there. Were no, you I, I wasn't, uh, wasn't in Vegas. I, ah. uh, well, that's probably why I didn't see you up there. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> You're playing well, though. You play... Uh, oh, well, if we're talking about that other game. Yeah, yeah though, I mean, the kind of, the kind of game that the, uh, the amateurs play. At. But you started when? Yeah, you've been uh, out for a while? Uh, ten years ago. Too late to ever learn it well. Yeah, well, I only started uh, last year, and that's... Uh, uh, it's hopeless, really. Well, you, you can learn to do it. You can learn the, the strokes and the strategy. You can get in the condition. But if you, it's a game that if you, if you start it after you're 12 years old, there's a top limit on how good you can get. You know, it's uh, the, the reflexes. I guess all the great people started when they were kids, didn't they? Sure. Uh -huh. There's no question. Uh, have you finished Earthquake already? Is that finished fair? Earthquake. Uh, Los Angeles is in ruins. <laughs> now? Yeah, well, now somebody I... who was on that the other day we were talking was on the show. Was in that. It was also. Ava Gardner, George Kennedy, <laughs> Who was it? Victoria Principal. Victoria oh, Principal, yeah. A beautiful girl. She said that was a fascinating, uh, fascinating picture. It was uh, quite a thing to work on. I think uh, everyone is, especially that, that lives in the San Andreas Fault, as most of us in Southern California do, is, is kind of a, a macabre fascination with the subject of earthquakes. Mm. And. Uh, you know, I've done some interviews ab about the picture, and they say, now, now, what attitude do you take? And I said, earthquakes are bad for you, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> may be harmful to your health, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yet most people don't get up and move, No, you know, and, right. and they live with well, that I possibility. Well, I the picture's a big success, and it, persu it persuades a lot of people to move out of California. <laughs> That's all this part of the world lacks, you know, we need a little more elbow room. Yeah, now, when you did the, uh, the Airport 75, did, when you did a picture before, Skyjacked. Yeah, didn't yeah. you have to learn? Uh, we talked about that briefly one night, too. You got the seven of 707. 707 yeah. simulator and went through all of the procedures. And but the, this one is about a 747. And so you had to redo the whole thing, huh? I went down to, to Dallas, where they have the only 747 simulator in the country. American Airlines runs it. It is an incredible machine. It's, you get the actual feeling that they can create almost any conditions. They can. They not? You are sitting Visually, in, you in see. the flight deck of a 747. Uh, and anything you do to the controls uh, not only are registered on the instruments, but you hear it happen and you see it happen. There's a visual component built in for, I think, another million and a half dollars, the American Airlines people. In other words, if you're coming in for a landing or something and you do something and they, wrong. And they read into it, what they say, give us Heathrow Airport in London, uh, uh, twilight, ceiling 1,200 feet, visibility five miles. Mm. And there you are. And if you, uh, you're coming in and you let down the landing gear and you hear it go down, you hear it and the, the airspeed drops, the flight attitude changes, and it's, it's an incredible... Uh, Did you uh, have any bad boo-boos at all? 
Now, I survived, Johnny. Yeah. I survived. But what was kind of interesting, one of the premises of this picture is that uh, on a 747 in flight, mm -hmm. they are incidentally incredible aircraft. They really are. Pilots say it's machines. the best ship uh, and the safest Most, thing. Yes, they love in, them. in the air. There's no question. Right. And, but the premise of the story is that a 747 in flight is struck by a light aircraft on the flight deck, knocks out a corner of the flight deck, a uh, big chunk, right wide open, either kills or disables all the flight qualified personnel in the crew, the pilot, the co-pilot, so on. And, but the plane is still flying, it's on autopilot, and they can sustain that kind of an impact, but there's mm -hmm. nobody can land the plane. And so it's not much to look forward to, is no, it? No, it's, it's not. It's so far, so good. Yeah. You know, yeah. they said the plane yeah, now is for the now bad. for the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to fly for another two hours. Now the bad news: nobody can land it. Now, so in other words, you tell the passengers. Well, and the uh, <coughs> the premise is that one of the stewardesses, who has no flight training, played by Karen Black is talked through some level turns because they're only at, uh, I think, 2,500 feet mm -hmm. in the Salt Lake City area where there are mountains that are higher than that. Right. So you can't just keep flying straight. And uh, one of the airline executives, played by me, talks her through some level turns from the ground till they can get somebody into the aircraft by helicopter that can land the plane. It would be possible, strangely enough. The, Air Corps, the Air Corps says it, the Air Force says it's possible. If somebody is cool and followed explicitly the instructions, I think almost anybody who could follow those this directions would This was one of the things that flight. we tested uh, down in, in Dallas, because many of the pilots that have read the script that I've given it to, about half and half, some of them said, no, you couldn't do it. If I think while they're in flight, yes, landing may be a whole different thing, yeah. you know, and actually doing that procedure. But we tried a couple of stewardesses from the training school that didn't know how to fly. Right. And we brought them over, and the instructor talked one of them through a level turn. Never been in a uh, plane before. That's fascinating. And I talked the other one through. And so now we're, I'm convinced that it's possible. Great. Let me take a brief uh, pause here, and we'll be right back after this short word from one of our sponsors. Welcome back. We're talking with Chuck Hessen. You've played so many different varied roles in your life, and I, I suppose you get tired of some of the questions, but a lot of these, like the, the thing in the airport, require a lot of uh, pre-preparation, learning to fly yeah, the 707. That's kind of an interesting part of the work. And right? when they played Ben-Hur, replayed it again here a couple of weeks ago, yeah. I watched the whole thing again because that was one of the great spectacles ever made, and you were superb in it. And, of course, everybody's waiting for that great... The race. Ch chariot scene at the end, which was absolutely... It was fixed, you know. Fixed, yeah. You I knew I was going <laughs> to <win. laughs> But everybody says, how did they do that? And, uh, very, very carefully. Carefully. Because <laughs> obviously you had to drive in some of those scenes, yeah. in a great many of them. Yeah, most of it, yeah. Now, did, did you go to a chariot school? <laughs> most of them are closed, you know, now. Yeah. There wasn't a hell of, <laughs> hell of a big very little demand for that. You don't get in the yellow pages and say, yeah. chariot, chariot school. Yeah. That's true. I, I went over two months before we started shooting. I Fortunately, I'd ridden and been around horses a lot right. in my life. But driving a chariot something else again and i never had driven a team let alone a, a four horse team right and i was spent two months learning to drive a little bit some is, professional uh yeah yakima cannot oh yeah the great stunt man who directs sequence, the greatest uh, stunt man the legendary stunt right. man in history he's in his 70s now isn't he and yeah. still active his son joe cannot is now the greatest stunt man alive and one of the best second unit directors alive and joe doubled me for the the fall in it, and doubled me for the stuff I didn't drive, but between his dad taught me to drive. It's one of many skills I've collected that for which I have no further use. <laughs> now, Anybody did, need a chariot driver? Yeah, you did the football, you played the, uh, In number the one, aging quarterback I, uh, number I one. I spent about uh, five months, not every day, you know, right. but over a period of five months with Craig Fertig of uh, SC, the quarterback coach of SC, and then down with the New Orleans Saints learning to look like a pro quarterback a little bit. Right. And, uh, oh, I did a picture with Max Schell called Counterpoint, in which I was supposed to be a symphonic conductor. I uh, learned to do that a little bit. Again, to look like right. you can do it. And that took several months of, of work. And then when I did played Michelangelo, I had to learn to paint the Sistine ceiling. And then uh, <laughs> you then used Rex a you said, used a ruler, didn't you? To wallpaper. <laughs> Rex Harrison said what? He said I've, I've changed my mind. We're going to wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever uh, had any injuries doing uh, any of these things? I cracked a rib doing uh, number one. On the we, football thing. Yeah. 
You know, pro football, probably you would. That was about the roughest thing you well, could get involved it was, in. Well, it was a planned shot, and those guys are superb athletes, you know. And they, But they've got to come at you, what, 70% or so, or right. it looks ridiculous. And they knew exactly what they were going to do. But I turned in midair, and a guy was supposed to catch me with his shoulder pad and lay off it. I, and he was off his feet, too, and he caught me with his helmet. And they said you could hear the crack from the sidelines. Mm. And I lay and I fell, and of course the wind was knocked out of me. And that bit where they come over and they're lifting your belt, you know, like this, and I like this. And this guy comes over and leans over. He says, "Welcome to the NFL." <laughs> <laughs> That's, con that's considered a minor injury, a cracked rib. They just yeah. put a little tape around you and send them back in yeah, half of the time. And <laughs> when, you, when you first started, it, it's always fascinating, and people are interested uh, when they meet people who are, are so well-known and been successful, uh, what they did in the early days. and uh, Were there any times in your career when you were... You lived in New York, didn't yeah. you, uh, with the, uh, your wife, in Lydia? In Hell's Kitchen, yeah. Yeah, in the, trying to get into acting that and so That was a nice forth. neighborhood. Then. Hell's Kitchen was a... Well, it, we never had any trouble. We had people we liked lived around us. I remember the fellow lived underneath us, rented a gun. No rented kidding. a gun? Yeah, he did. He never, he was on, he had no record. He was on no wanted lists or anything. He wouldn't dream of committing a felony himself, right. but he would rent a gun. Just in case. Yeah, if you wanted to hold up somebody. I mean, you could rent the gun from yeah, him? That's right, yeah. That's, that's no kidding. Yeah. But it was re it really was a nice neighborhood. We lived in a fourth floor. <laughs> it was. Sounds well, a guy you. who rents guns below you. <laughs> What'd you pay in those days in the Hell's Kitchen? Ah, uh, thirty dollars a month. Thirty bucks a month. Uh, then I started doing movies, and we we finally moved from there. When I realized uh, by mistake one year, I I got a car and I ended up with it back east. So I garaged it across the street from where I lived, and I suddenly realized after about four months I was paying more to garage the car than I was for the apartment. <laughs> Did you ever get discouraged when you were trying to break into acting and say, hey, maybe this is not the direction I want to go, and uh, you know, that's it's too insecure? Or it's, did... it's a ridiculous way to make a living. It's, it's impossible. I suppose most people's parents, yeah. usually if you find you're going into acting or theater, they say, oh, oh. get a nice trade, yes. you know, make waste baskets or something. Or get a, a good profession. Yeah. But uh, I can't... In other words, logically, if you're going to, to make a living acting, you're out of your mind because you can't do it. Right. Uh, but I can't remember going through that. I was reasonably lucky early on. Right. My wife got work before I did. She got a play on Broadway before I did and got a lead before I did. But um, I began to make a minimal living fairly early on. But and may, I guess when you're 19, why you can you had a absorb set. a lot of disappointment. Yeah, and if you get that measure of success fairly early, yeah, you'll say, hey, this is not too okay. bad. It's gonna make, you're gonna make it. Your son's in a marine biology, is he not? Down right? at UCSD, yeah. Yes, is that, is that what he's gonna do with his life? Yeah, he's uh, thinking of transferring to UCLA uh, next year, but, which would be nice to have him home. But. Right. I know you have to leave uh, early tonight, and uh, but I know you wanted to mention something, and not to, to, to particularly leave on a downer, but it is worth talking about, because I read an article on this over the weekend, and the alarming thing was that you uh, have something to do with the suicide prevention. And the interesting thing I read, I think it was in the Los Angeles Times this week, that there's a great deal of that among the young people in this country, of, of high school and college age, which was not always so, but it seems to be one of the well, highest the rates. The interesting thing about this two statistics that terrify me about suicide. One, it is one of the major causes of death in this country. While we've been talking, someone in the United States has committed suicide, for example, on this show. The show wasn't is that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I know what you're, you're trying to make the point, but...